Send it a six BTU of electricity and forget transmission, storage, all those things. The unit cost then is about 100 or 20% higher for hydrogen, which is surprisingly, I mean, you'd think there would be a higher differential. Now, it must also be noted that the price of natural gas, and I haven't included these figures, but I want to point it out to you, is actually much cheaper than either electricity or hydrogen. But again, because of the price fluctuation due to, at least in the United States, the recent deregulation of gas is not possible to present a realistic figure at this time. And those, I don't know what the situation is in Canada with respect to price controls on natural gas, but I suspect sooner or later it will get phase coupled to the U.S. price deregulation thing, and it seems to historically follow that way. Now, in the opinion of Penner and other authorities who agree with him, I uh, damage something which is... Um, in the opinion of Penner, if the hydrogen production cost component of its total cost could be reduced only threefold, it would become a viable alternate energy source. Now, in order to achieve such a threefold reduction in production costs, several major breakthroughs would have to be made. One, the endergonic reaction is the part, the amount of energy actually absorbed by water <coughs> with electrolytic driving to get the gas out, okay? Endergonic, for those of you who don't know the term. A technological breakthrough that permits 100% conversion efficiency of water by electrical electrolysis fission into the two gases, hydrogen as fuel and oxygen as oxidant. For comparative figures, for those you may not be familiar, the efficiency of DC electrolysis at this time, and again, this depends on the method of accounting, and we can discuss that later, is anywhere between 50% to 74%. That's by so-called electrolytic chemistry Faraday law of counting. Number two, you need a breakthrough in hydrogen production, and this is a very key element of my work, in situ. That means a technological breakthrough that eliminates the need and cost of hydrogen liquefaction and storage, transmission and distribution by producing the fuel in situ <coughs> when and where it is needed. Now, let me explain that one point. I gave, as I say, this talk in, uh, in Toronto, and I think we had very distinguished scientists there, both from the University of Toronto and around the world. And one of the scientists who I have great respect for uh, made the comment uh, to my wife later on that this business of hydrogen is just hogwash because it's too dangerous, it's explosive. I call that the Hindenburg mentality. Mm -hmm. Now the reason for that is that everybody knows hydrogen is explosive, but it's explosive when you produce it and you compress it and you liquefy and you put it in heavy containers and start fooling around with it in terms of movement. I just want to make it clear that the invention that I have <coughs> developed, and I wish I didn't have to use the word I, it sounds like an ego thing, totally eliminates that phase of hydrogen utilization. My development actually produces the hydrogen as it is used. There's no storage, there's no liquefaction, there's no transmission. The only uh, um, um, Transmission is to find water somewhere to pour into your tank. And you do that with a bucket, usually, by hand, and does not enter into our thermodynamic <laughs> equations. The third breakthrough required is that in the exergonic reaction that is using the hydrogen and oxygen, whether you're going to drive a turbine or you're going to make steam out of it or run it directly in a fuel cell, should also be 100% efficient in its energy release, uh, and I'll comment on that later in terms of fuel cells, turbines, and so on. None of them are 100% efficient, as far as I know, in the present state of art. Number four, engine efficiency. You really need a breakthrough by combining the breakthroughs under one, two, and three that I've just cited, 
and utilize them in a highly efficient engine to do work. And in my opinion, and I'll try to reason this out with you, it is actually possible to achieve a 15 to 20 percent surplus of energy return over the en energy input that is in the ideal case, and we're disregarding the actual effect of a load while you're uh, using the, uh, the hydrogen as fuel. Now, this part of the talk is now technical because I'm going to describe for you, and this is really the first time I'm describing it publicly, uh, because in Toronto we had problems with this kind of projector and so on, I never showed my slides. So here, thanks to Andrew's uh, uh, work, we have a uh, page projector. Now, the, uh, I think one of the important aspects of this invention, as I just described, is you skip <coughs> liquefaction, storage, and transmission problems of the fuel. And this alone gives a total cost, both in terms of energy expended. It takes a lot of energy to liquefy gases, as you know, uh, and transportation and other costs. Both energy and cost savings are about 25% immediately. And again, that depends what part of the world you are, how good your technology is, and so on. Now this, I call it a TD device for it's a contraction for thermodynamic. It's based on what I think is a new discovery because as far as I've been able to establish by a very deep search of the world literature, uh, nobody to my knowledge has had an efficient use of alternating currents to get water electrolysis. So that is the novel aspect that I'm presenting to you tonight. Now, I have been doing tests almost for a year repeatedly, and I'll explain how I do the tests, where I can pretty well come to close to 100% efficiency on the average from test to test. Uh, I'm always varying parameters, so I, I never really run the test for pure efficiency uh, because the tests are very costly, and I'll just explain briefly. When I measure how much electric electricity I'm putting into the thermodynamic device, which I'll show you. I have to have very precision measurement, almost counting for every electron going into solution. When I measure the product, which is hydrogen and oxygen, I have to use very expensive mass spectrometers or uh, gas chromatography equipment, which I personally don't own, because I think everybody knows here I'm a full, full researcher. But it does cost me 75 bucks an hour to use these machines, and a good run usually costs me about a thousand bucks. So I'm very careful how I do it, and everything has to be absolutely right. But uh, I do test new parameters every time I make use of these rather expensive machines. So the average efficiency um, fluctuates around 100%. I do get better, I do get worse, depending on what I'm testing. and. Again, I emphasize that no laws of physics are violated in this process because we can account pretty much uh, in a scientific way for every uh, factor in the thermodynamics. I'm going to start putting this on the wall to give you an idea of what we're talking about. <coughs> Is that visible to everybody? More or less? Okay. Um, <coughs> this is called component one, and this is the electrical signal that I generate to break up the water. Uh, these are unique circuits. I don't give you the fine details. I have some 61 patents on this particular circuit system, which I've collected all over the world for the last 20 years. But basically, you start at this end. This is a coaxial electrode. Looking down from the top, there's a center electrode here, and there's a ring electrode. Going backwards, we have an inductor in one line, an inductor in another line, and this is called, for those of you who are technically oriented, a series L, that's inductance, C, the C.